because they, they've got other commitments, but they wanted to have a recording of this. So we'll wait, we'll wait for another couple of minutes for to uh, see people come on. And then. Um, Oh, <laughs> it's, it is transcribing at the moment. I've, I'm going to switch that off because it's a bit <laughs> disconcerting. It's a bit disconcerting. We're just waiting for another couple of minutes to check to check if uh, anyone else is coming online and then we'll, we'll start. But uh, the good thing is we've got um, Rachel here um, and we've already had a check to see whether the screen shares and that does. Um, Rachel, I'll get you to just introduce yourself after I do the, the acknowledgement of country. Sounds good. OK, we'll get going. So um, welcome, everyone. My name is Ian Gordon. I am the president of the NITRA Oceania. That's the network of inter and transdisciplinary research organizations, Oceania. We're very fortunate today to have uh, Rachel Kelly from University of Tasmania, who will uh, give a presentation um, which is particularly relevant for, for ECR, um, ECRs within the university system. So, Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll acknowledge the country. Um, so uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we all meet today, including those of uh, New Zealand, where Ken and I are at the moment, and uh, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we're, we are meeting across um, Australia and the Oceania region. And so, um, Rachel, do you want to just introduce yourself and then share your screen and get going? And then I'm sure that we have some time for questions at the end. Perfect. Thank so, you. So let people know that I'm recording this. OK, thank you. Um, and I just wanted firstly to pay my respects to the Muanina people here in Nipalona, Hobart. Um, I'm obviously based in Tasmania today. So I'm Rachel Kelly and I'm the knowledge broker for the Centre for Marine Socioecology or CMS, which is a marine interdisciplinary organisation um, based down here in Tassie. Uh, we are a virtual research centre because um, we are bringing lots of different disciplines <laughs> and different disciplinary expertise together. Um, but we have a core team um, and lots of students. I think we have almost 40 students at the moment um, and a wide range of disciplines, including psychology and oceanography and law and behavioral economics um, more natural sciences like ecology as well um, and a broad range. So it's very interesting. And my research background is in marine socioecology, so all inherently interdisciplinary um, and in the human dimensions of the ocean space. So increasingly, my work has looked at, um, I guess, connecting people to the ocean and also using those kinds of insights um, to leverage more pro environmental behaviour for ocean sustainability and more sustainable ocean management as well, among array of other things. So um, let me try and share my slides. All going well so far, which is never a good thing. I get suspicious. How's that? Good, great, great. Um, so when I was asked to do this talk, I thought that I was just talking with the Nitro folks and um, didn't realize that we would have ECRs here as well. So that's fantastic, A, eh? but um, I might be preaching to the choir a little bit. Um, and I've designed this to be very informal. So please 
just ask a question if you have one as we go along, noting that I can't really see any of your faces right now, so just unmute yourself and ask the question if needed. Um, but basically, this talk is just all about how can we better develop interdisciplinary early career researchers um, and what directions are we headed, where are the gaps, where is their progress, um, and what NITRO and other organisations can do to help facilitate more effective interdisciplinary learning um, and development for early career researchers. Obviously, all of my research is in the marine space, so um, there will be a marine bias here, but most of the lessons and insights are definitely um, more than relevant and can be applied to other contexts as well. So for my um, presentation, I'll definitely just start talking about how how are we developing interdisciplinary early career researchers and how has that kind of come about in the first place? Um, what types of challenges and enablers do ECORs face, um, vocalised by themselves? And how can we as a collective from the ECR level to more senior researchers to the institutional level start to engage this next generation and the future generation of interdisciplinary research leaders? So I just wanted to start off with um, this paper. I just wanted to give a nod to it to kind of open up. Um, this is some work that we did a couple of years ago from the CMS and I'm sure several of you have probably seen it already. Um, but this paper emerged from a need. Um, the lead authorship team, so myself and Mary Mackay at the time were PhD students and Kirsty Nash and Chris Vitanovic were um, postdocs and we just started at the Centre for Marine Socioecology and we're very keen and eager on engaging in inter interdisciplinary research but weren't really actually quite sure about how we could um, and how we could be good at it and what were the skills we needed um, and how we could I guess develop from so-so to much better. Um, and so at that time there was obviously a recognised need for interdisciplinary research but the actual institutional structures were still emerging about how to do that. Um, interdisciplinary research was and still is happening because of needs and calls and complex problems that demand complex um, solutions, but actual knowledge and how we can um, effectively develop and nurture interdisciplinary research and researchers was limited at that time and, and is still limited. Um, we were kind of, I guess, coming to grips with issues such as disciplinary languages, so people using different terms and um, maybe different approaches, not being able to really communicate across their disciplinary boundaries or beyond and transdisciplinary boundaries as well. And also grappling with the big question of, as we're developing our research careers, where should our expertise lie? You know, should it be in a discipline? Should it be in a region? Should it be in a certain topic? Um, should it be in interdisciplinary research? And, and when are you an expert in interdisciplinary research? So because we had all these questions that we couldn't really answer from the literature, we thought we should probably just engage with people who know the answers. So we brought together a team of world leading interdisciplinary researchers and just asked them that. Um, what they thought would make most effective interdisciplinary researchers, how we could support ECRs in particular to develop interdisciplinary research skills, and what were the skills and comp competencies that were key. Um, so basically, this whole study and paper and work was just built around this premise of how can early career researchers, one, best engage in interdisciplinary research, and two, best develop their interdisciplinary research skills. So the outputs after um, all of the work that we did was this um, kind of 10 tips that we consolidated all of those insights. Um, and I'm sure I can hand share this handout afterwards. But the thing that I really wanted to draw your attention to was the framework that we built it around. So the CAP framework on knowledge, attitudes um, and practices. So it's a, a framework drawn from psychology and basically it is around the premise that we target what researchers should know, so their knowledge and what they perceive, so their attitudes, um, so that they can do, so that their practices um, can do better or, or can do differently um, in relation to conducting interdisciplinary research. Um, 
and there's lots of different tips here um, I'm sure that most of them are pretty sensical, but you notice that the green are kind of more at the individual action and the two on the bottom um, in orange are more on that systemic or institutional action and need as well. Um, I think big ones for me um, that I keep reminding myself over and over and over again are um, to be open minded. Um, you know, I think we're trying to find solutions to things or we're trying to figure out complex problems. We tend to want to narrow things down when actually we should be opening our horizons a little bit and also to push your boundaries. Um, I think over and over and over again, when we're doing interdisciplinary work, it's uncomfortable and hard and, and you want to take a step back. But actually it's in that uncomfortable space that lots of really great things can happen. So I wanted to set the tone with this paper um, because a lot of the work that I've done or our team has done um, on engaging interdisciplinary early career researchers has been based off of this since, um, including this next work, um, which is led by Beth um, Nybor from Canada. And basically, um, this was a group of people working in the transdisciplinary fisheries space. Um, and having really similar problems about how can early career researchers better engage in inter and transdisciplinary research and um, why is it difficult in the first place and what kinds of enablers are there um, that we can take and make next steps to achieve the goals of transdisciplinary research. So basically, um, we brought together an early career workshop at the World Fisheries Congress, the last one, um, and engaged this whole group of um, early career researchers from around the world, um, and Beth led this team. So kind of our first exercise in the workshop was to identify shared barriers that we had in conducting interdisciplinary research. Um, and the first one here was obviously the mismatch between academic institutions, their expressed enthusiasm for interdisciplinary research, like interdisciplinary research is needed, it's um, necessary, but then versus their inability to provide the adequate financial and structural, um, including learning and development support for that as well. Another barrier that we collectively identified was that interdisciplinary research, research takes so much longer typically um, and allowances need to be made. So, for example, for building the project team, for relationships, for developing new skills, for bringing things together and the whole actual innovation process as well. Um, and then further, the lack of mentorship um, and skill development opportunities. So what we discussed was that, yes, there's heaps of um, conceptual approaches suggested in the literature, but there was actual very little guidance or practical examples on how to actually apply those concepts practically. Um, and early career researchers reflected that they often have to do things by trial and error and um, with little help from their home institutes um, or supervisors. And they reflected that lots of people were doing the same things over and over again in different places around the globe, but actually it would have been great to have connected in the first place. Um, and so I guess we had to move on from those challenges and identify what were our enablers. Um, oh, I just wanted to flag that as well, actually, that because we were a global group um, with definitely shared and similar issues, um, people more typically from the global south um, or from more disadvantaged areas of the world felt that these were much exacerbated for them in their experiences. Um, I think, don't think unsurprising at all, but really important to highlight that. Um, and our enablers. So we reflected on what kinds of things or, or actions or systems would better position um, early career researchers to do inter and transdisciplinary research more effectively. And I guess um, with more self-efficacy and competency. So from the individual level, operating as an ECR. Um, a lot of us had um, at that point and have continued to form kind of peer mentorship networks, either informally in our own institutes or kind of more global networks as well to start to, to share insights and experiences um, and build interdisciplinary projects together. Um, and in that way, we've been able to communicate the different approaches that we're using and um, those trial and error things that I talked about already, what did work, what didn't work and share lessons. 
another enabler is obviously the more established researcher. I guess where that's where Nitro comes in. Um, people who can provide more consistent and holistic mentorship. So people who have been in this field for 20 years or longer, who have kind of seen the ups and downs, can identify the, the directions um, in which it's headed and are really aware of the skills and competencies needed to build successful interdisciplinary teams, for example. Um, they also have a huge role to play in making ECR voices heard. Um, I think, you know, people in power do really need to make space for emerging voices um, and, and give them, I guess, the, the nurturing and the mentorship to be more confident in that voice as well. And finally, um, the institution level. Um, there's always lots of points in the institution level, um, but I guess reflecting on the academic or research system um, and that problem of the single researcher and, and almost an entrepreneurship of having to think of yourself all the time, that individualism, um, and rethinking the allocation of funding was also a really big one. You know, we talk about how interdisciplinary research is a bit more trendy and, and wanted, but actually the funding schemes aren't really designed um, to fund interdisciplinary research um, yet. Typically, you want one um, lead investigator, for example, where lots of interdisciplinary research projects might have two or three um, who are really key and, and are central and should be deserving of that title as well. Um, and the development and implementation of new impact metrics. So um, I guess interdisciplinary research takes more time to do. So even if it's higher quality sometimes, um, I think quality over quantity, we don't really see that reflected in academic metrics. Um, also the impact, we know that interdisciplinary research doesn't necessarily get as many uh, reads or hits as disciplinary research in the short term, but in the long term is much more impactful. Um, there's lots of uh, reasons why current metrics don't really fit to celebrate the interdisciplinary system. Um, but I guess, you know, thinking from Nitro and beyond, this is also a really key place that organisations like Nitro or, or different universities and systems can play a big role in facilitating more effective interdisciplinary research and nurturing the, um, I guess, interdiscipl interdisciplinary research leaders of the future. But where to from here? Um, this final paper that I just wanted to touch on was led by uh, Aaron Satterthwaite from the US and Valeria Kongakova, also from the CMS here in Tasmania. Um, and we all came together under the guise of the UN decade. So the UN Ocean decade, sorry. So um, basically the UN Ocean decade um, is recognizing the key role of early career researchers or early career ocean professionals, as they call them, ECOPs, um, and recognizing that sustainability really is dependent upon future actions and future leaders. We're not gonna achieve long-term sustainability today, although we're setting ourselves in good directions. Um, and the UN decade also recognizes that early career researchers are, are innovators. They have new ideas, um, they have novel ways of doing things, of bringing things together, different ways of communicating and connecting and of seeing the world. And if we are going to come up with novel solutions and if we are going to achieve sustainability, then early career researchers are an essential ingredient to that because they can bridge generational gaps, I guess, bringing um, established or, or older practices and research um, up to speed with more modern approaches. They can enhance knowledge, knowledge transfer, um, really, I guess, a, a generation of good communicators, I think, as standard. Um, and also, as I said, develop innovative solutions to novel and emerging problems. Um, but how can we position and empower emerging and future research leaders? So this was what this work was all done. Um, again, I just want to nod that the context was definitely um, in the focus of co-designing ocean solutions, um, but definitely the insights um, and directions outlined have potential to be applied to other contexts as well. So um, working together, um, we um, facilitated the design of these five, what we called actionable pillars 
or I guess steps in the right direction um, to engage early career researchers in inter and transdisciplinary work um, that obviously was aimed at addressing ocean sustainability challenges. Um, and here I just wanted to focus on three of these that are intended to position and empower ECRs kind of on that um, individual or, or peer level. Um, and one is sharing knowledge. So as I talked about before, um, early career researchers um, increasingly are really good about connecting and developing mentor um, mentorship networks. Um, that, that would include knowledge sharing and peer-to-peer -peer mentorship um, and I guess developing connections on that peer level, not necessarily or always engaging with more senior researchers um, for pros and cons, I would say. Um, Cross-boundary education and opportunities was another pillar that we identified. So education is obviously related to the training aspects that I've discussed, um, connecting to research users, so really understanding the context um, and I guess having an awareness of where interdisciplinary research sits um, and, and why we do it um, and, and the directions that it is heading in. Um, and also key is the role of championing ECORs and the decision making processes around those. Um, and finally, incentivizing um, more inclusive and participatory governance structures. So I think that um, for early career researchers to be more actively participating in interdisciplinary research, they have to be allowed to shape their research agendas um, and directions um, and identify you know, who are the players, um, who are the groups, but oftentimes because of the hierarchical systems in um, academia and research, it's there aren't really many early career voices heard in those boards or committees um, and they don't get an active voice. Um, so I guess a big call in this work was thinking beyond hierarchical systems and, and more novel approaches to novel sharing um, that could potentially be informal, but also recognising the diversity of people involved in the research process. Um, so I guess from there, what I really wanted to highlight for the last point um, was some practical examples of how we're doing that. Um, and I'm drawing on examples from the Centre for Marine Sociology about how we are positioning and empowering early career researchers. So the first example is our Future Ocean Leaders course that we've been doing um, for the last quarter. So this was um, ECR led and we have an emerging ECR network within the centre, which is exciting. And together with Dr. Rebecca Shellock, um, I co-designed this leadership training course <laughs> over three modules. And so basically we brought um, leadership experts and consultants in a house uh, to deliver these three workshops. So one on different styles of leadership um, and, and the different approaches you can take to leadership and research, personalities and leadership, which was a big call given that operating in different disciplines, um, you need to consider different norms and styles of doing um, and different, I guess, different types of people um, with different worldviews. Um, and then finally, we are just about to have our values-based leadership course um, next week, thinking about, you know, the context of the work that you're doing um, and how you bring your skills and experiences um, to deliver that, I guess, more concretely and effectively. Um, a big part of this, though, as well, has been the knowledge transfer. So sharing um, experiences between peers and also gaining insights um, from senior level mentors um, informally, but also formally to a more senior um, leadership panel as well. Um, the second example I wanted to highlight was the interdisciplinary research training that we do, um, including our very recent spring school that we had last month. I saw Renee was online, so that's nice to see one of our students. Um, and basically in this course, um, we it wasn't just the Centre for Marine Sociology students, but others from interstate um, and abroad. Um, and our focus this year was on inter and transdisciplinary approaches for sustainable marine futures. Um, this is our second research training course. Um, so um, I guess we're getting lots of feedback and, and learning how to do it better from the students, but um, it covers diverse topics. So we're not just looking at different disciplines and their approaches, but more about how do we bring those insights together. So really structured around systems thinking, 
um, working across different cultures, um, getting students to think about the epistemology and the why and, and the knowledge about doing um, and co-designing projects with stakeholders, um, not just thinking about a great research idea, but, but trying to solve problems to research uh, to stakeholder needs. Um, and a big part of this interdisciplinary research course um, was the working with stakeholders project. So we invited Tasmanian marine stakeholders to come in and pitch some of their big issues. And then students um, brought themselves into teams and developed interdisciplinary project proposals over the course um, of the week um, and then pitched them to the stakeholders in real time at the end of the week and, and got to, I guess, get a real sense of what stakeholders need and um, the kind of dialogue that you have with them and the kinds of materials that you need to uh, deliver when you're trying to um, conduct and, and develop practical projects. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to flag as another way to start engaging um, interdisciplinary ECRs was in project design. So not just by equipping ECRs with leadership, not just by giving people interdisciplinary skills, but also then at that more, I guess, center or institution level, thinking about when you're designing projects, like where and how can you better position early career researchers? So um, Future Seas 2030 was a big interdisciplinary project that we led a couple of years ago. Um, and basically, um, it was also linked to the UN Ocean Decade. And the UN Ocean Decade is looking at um, how can we achieve a, a better and more sustainable ocean by 2030. And Future Seas, this project basically looked at, we have a lot of information already. We have a lot of science already. Um, so how can we imagine more sustainable futures at 2030 with the information that we already have? And we identified 12 different ocean challenges and then worked in interdisciplinary teams um, to um, design and, and foresight business as usual futures and more sustainable futures under 2030 as well. I think over 150 interdisciplinary researchers were involved. Um, but a real big part of this project was its focus on mentoring early career researchers. So for each of the challenges, there was a, a project team that would workshop and um, the foresighting of the more sustainable futures, but also there was a paper a research paper project from each of them as well. And each of the paper projects were led by early career researchers um, who were then mentored by more senior researchers in the field. So these are people who were coming to the end of their PhDs or just starting postdocs um, really in that early, early career stage. Um, and the aim was to give them a really I guess, um, a real experience of interdisciplinary project um, uh, with the support and guidance, um, I guess, and fallback of having a more senior interdisciplinary researcher involved. So I guess, obviously, given so many people and so many personalities, the intentions versus reality is a conversation that we've continued to have. Um, some of the teams worked really well together where the mentor was strong and others didn't um, probably because mentors weren't really aware of the skills they needed to share or the competencies competencies they needed to support and um, so currently we're working with our CMS ECR network to um, reflect on those um, and we're doing a study on on how best to mentor and support support early career researchers building on our experiences there um, so there are the practical examples, I guess I wanted to flag. And then the last thing I wanted to do was I'd had a quick look at Nitro's strategic plan and, and what you'd said about early career researchers. And I, I think, you know, it's it's really aimed in the work that we're doing and you're definitely echoing ECR needs um, about providing more effective pathways and, and supporting. Um, but I guess they are more general words and it would be really great to start considering and, and thinking like what kinds of specific training um, is needed to develop future leaders um, and, and how to um, advocate and position and empower um, early career or future interdisciplinary researchers as well. So um, that's it to start a conversation. Um, and a summary. But what I'd like to talk about, um, maybe you've got other questions, but um, I'd love to know about 
how better we can start engaging this next generation of interdisciplinary researchers and, and what kind of role does NITRO or other organisations have um, in facilitating that. So thanks, folks. Thanks, Rachel. Excellent talk. It's great to have such a comprehensive uh, view about what you're doing with the ECRs and to bring the ECR voice into the Nitro Oceania um, network. It's um, it's an opportunity for us to have this conversation, as you said. You know, we have as in Nitro part of our strategy that relates to ECRs, and Beth has been very Beth Fulton has been very um, uh, pivotal in in bringing that conversation to to the Nitro Oceania table, but. Um, the the practicality of what that might look like is something that we still have to develop. So it's a, an important conversation to have. Are there any comments or questions from around the the, the traps? If so, um, I put your hand up or or just come off mute and ask a question, Gabriel. Uh, thanks, Rachel. That was really a great overview. I, I just popped in the chat that the Global Alliance for Inter- and Transdisciplinarity, if, if you folks don't know about it, has an early career researcher working group, um, which is um, doing things pretty similar to what you're trying to do. And so it might be worth linking up with them. Thanks. So anyone else? If, if not, then I, 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 I think that they, um, points you raise, raise in your um, challenges and enablers, Rachel, yeah. are, are, are actually, a lot of those are institutional level. Um, yeah, the, the challenges are, are, are often institutional level in relation to career recognition, um, for example, and um, where, you know, it's, this is for this is for the for the grouper around here. Where do we think that the most um, bang for the buck could could occur in terms of support for early career researchers in terms of both developing their inter and transdisciplinary skills and also their leadership skills to ultimately you we see it as becoming the future leaders of the inter and transdisciplinary research organisations. I'll touch on it and I think I, I, I would just more plant more questions for everyone else. But I mm. think that um, yes, there are institutional problems, but there are so many institutional issues and um, issues with academic research systems already that I think that we can point to the problems, but it's probably quite difficult to find solutions to those right now. And I guess you need to find that middle or Goldilocks space of where you can have impact without not making perhaps drastic changes. And I guess that's why increasingly we're always trying to reach out to more senior uh, researchers and um, talking to different kind of uh, smaller level organizations, um, global networks and, and people who kind of have cultural change. Um, and I think the cultural change is probably the part that we can have the most impact in right now. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that um, one of the things that leaders of organisations can do is is drive culture change through through um, the ways in which they they recognise and incentivize different behaviours. In effect, um, and part part of that is through um, through the career progression, the, the discretionary funding, and how that is that, that is delivered to support that. And so um, I think that there's there's a piece for a conversation around um, different different layers within. I mean, I mean, you talk about it being hierarchical, but but it's sort of like layers within the complex ecosystem that is that is uh, inter and transdisciplinary research as to how we can most effectively use the leaders that we have as leaders of organisations in order to, to get that cultural change to happen. Ken, do you have a view? Well, I just look, 
I wanted to say, look, I really enjoyed the presentation, Rachel. I mean, it was it was really good. I was sort of sitting there in, in heated agreement uh, with everything you said. Um, look, I, you know, I think that the issue of recognition and reward is, is fundamentally important to this. And if you can influence your institutions to think beyond the more traditional ways of doing this, and I mean, again, this, this takes kind of leadership, um, I think you can you can move a long way. And I was actually going to ask you a question, Rachel, which was, what for you have been the most effective things in your career that have that have got you to where you are now? How is it that you are able to now be kind of a champion for emerging career researchers, uh, and and to be in a position to, um, you know, undertake these great initiatives? What what worked for you? Um, I would. Definitely, without thinking about anything else, say really, really good mentorship. So I guess a lot of the interdisciplinary research opportunities I've had are because um, more senior researchers have, have pointed them out to me or encouraged me to get involved um, or, or thought of me to invite me in in the first place. Um, and then so that kind of more senior level of mentorship, but also peer to peer mentoring as well and, and discussing these kinds of issues with my peers um, and trying to come up with solutions and work on those and identify other people with the same issues and the same solutions elsewhere. So I think it's been that that culture thing and that's probably why I have such a change the culture lens. <laughs> so, so do you think that's just been serendipitous or is the kind of a you know a, a growing acceptance by those sort of people who are operating at a sort of mentoring level in institutions that there is an opportunity here and that you know we're, we're all part of a culture change however incremental yeah. that might be yeah it's probably i think um exactly like you said an opportunity as opposed to a need and a probably a recognition of the value in having younger voices um i guess in this very dynamic space as well and bringing different ways of knowing and, and different ways of uh, of thinking and considering this. Um, yeah. So mine's a different version of Ken's question. Do you want to talk a little bit about how the institution has supported you? So I'm presuming you've been given funding to run some of these workshops that you've run, at, you know, at a, at a very practical level. What are the, and it'd be great to hear from others on the call as well. What are the things that you found helpful both in, you know what what are what are the things that institutions have done that would be great that those are the sorts of kind of practical steps that I think helps leaders think about what they could do yeah I, I think um I, I touch it at the center level so um I've been working with the center for marine socioecology since like on and off um since I started my PhD and I finished my PhD in 2019. Um, and the CMS is a champion of interdisciplinary research. And the way that the centre has been set up is to include ECR voices. So in all of the, I guess, big decisions on research directions or, or setup, we generally, because of our size, are able to have conversations that bring in those younger voices. Um, those research training opportunities that I highlighted earlier were all developed because uh, students and ECUers have asked for them. So I guess um, there is a more horizontal horizontal um, structure there that people have access and know who to contact. So that's been a really enabling factor. And there's been funding made available to students and ECUers, and I definitely benefited from that as well. Um, I think at kind of the bigger institute, so at UTAS, University of Tasmania, um, again, people are supportive of interdisciplinary research, you know, conceptually, but the barriers remain in how the organisation is set up. Um, that being said, our VC and, and other leaders are really championing EC or sorry, interdisciplinary research um, and younger voices. So where there are blockages, um, we are now more able to kind of contact those people and, and ask for change, which has been amazing. But I think you need those people who are in a position of power that can, like, can make the change, change, making themselves accessible to those who are asking for change. Yeah. And Linda. Hello. Um, yeah. yeah, I just, uh, 
I'm still I'm just at the end of my PhD, but I'm a bit of an older voice, not necessarily the younger ECR voice, um, which I think is part of the reason why I'm drawn to transdisciplinary research. I think that experience that I've had in different ways has made me more inclined to do that. And I also I just wanted to say that I was part of a CRC for the honeybee products, which was very much and not just into very transdisciplinary without probably recognizing it in itself it just it just was it, by the end it realized how much it was but that fostered my project and I've you know loved being part I think you need to be part of a group that's working on a tut like a, a focus but brings all these different voices together and have opportunities to talk if you haven't got that you can't you can't really foster those projects so I think when you bring bring the researchers together to look at real world problems that are asking for different types of perspectives to be brought together. That that really helps for an ECR to see and to be engaged with those voices. So, I mean, I also come from geography, which to me is such a natural interdisciplinary slash transdisciplinary. But it's interesting we don't get a lot of, uh, I don't know, it doesn't have a very good, it's not particularly good at promoting itself. And I feel like it should be recognised more as being a discipline that if you're an interdisciplinary or you're in that way inclined, this is a really good place to be to foster that. And it should actually be something that geography promotes in itself and also people recognise. And then I think there's more to be done in that space to really give them a bit more um, focus as that it is really good about doing those things. Anyway, uh, that's my sort of two cents worth. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Lisa? Uh, you're on mute, Lisa. Okay. Thank you, Rachel, for the presentation today. I'm from CSIRO and we're grappling with many of the issues that you sort of highlighted here today. Our project has 15 ECRs on it that are leading various elements of the research and so it's a key focus for what we're trying to do. And I was like, struck by your comment about mentorship and how important that was for you and was wondering um, at CMS, if there's any sort of training or support that you provide to those mentors and the more senior um, researchers and scientists in these fields to d better support the ECRs? Um, is that something that you've looked into at all? Um, that's a really good question. And it's something that we have considered, and I think it's going to come out of this work that we're doing at the moment, um, reflecting on future Cs. And I guess there's two points. Um, of, of our experiences of that and the work that we're doing, but also my gut instinct around it as well, is that you have people who have the potential to be good mentors, but they don't really have the awareness or skills. Um, and then you can sort of enable them and position them and, and they can grow and develop as good mentors. And then there's also just, you have bad mentors. And, and maybe the problem is if people aren't being mentored that the people that are being put into position to mentor aren't the right ones as well. And so I think that a lot of the time in the work that we're doing, we sort of want to put X person into Y box, but actually you do need to leave scope for people connecting um, and being able to relate to each other and those kind of natural relationships that really successful mentorship partnerships can grow from as well, I think. Yeah. There's, um, there's clearly a space for men mentoring the mentors as well. Um, yeah. You know, when, when, um, it, in the same way as some supervisory panels for PhD students have a, have a sort of um, a mentor supervisor who is there to help support the development of early career supervisors. Um, and 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 so um, there's there's I think I think we could be a lot better at, at working out what mentorship means, how it's delivered and how we get it recognized as something that that people both engage with from the from the from the mentor side and the mentee side and, then. and i think really good mentorship you know there's like learning on both sides so mm. you know ideally like those people become mentors at different parts of the relationship and um yeah. that is opportunity for for both parties to grow so it's not just a, mm. a knowledge transfer it's an exchange i think as well and a lot of the time it isn't seen as that. Yeah. <coughs> any any other questions? Comments? No. So um, I think one of the things that I will do is take this back to the conversation with. Oh. 
I'm oh, sorry, someone just said Renee has to leave early. Um, I'll take this back to a conversation with the executive of, of Nitro um, about how it is that we sort of uh, finesse the, the strategy and the actions that are, are coming out of that. Um, I think I think there are opportunities without um, wanting to overpromise and under deliver opportunities for offering offering um, le leaders the opportunity to to um, mentor ECRs within within the network, right? Um, but that the, that that I'll have to discuss with the executive as to how we might make that work effectively. But. Yeah. Um, but hopefully we've we've managed to answer some of your questions, Rachel. That you've you've brought you brought many more insights than we have been able to answer questions that you might have have had. And so it really thank you very much indeed for uh, your presentation today and and making a safe self available for us to have conversation with you. Thanks for listening, and hopefully we can thanks. continue the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks so much. Have a good one, folks. Take care. Take care, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.